thank you, Saf, Asu, uh, for reminding me who I am at this age. We need it. Uh, uh, Asu said a few words or, um, already about what I'm talking. Uh, I feel a little, I should say, perhaps diffident or odd to stand here and, uh, and talk uh, uh, at the opening ceremony for the data center uh, with a po talk that could have had the subtitle, When Ignorance is Bliss. Uh, so uh, at least uh, I will try to explain it, but uh, uh, that, uh, oh, and hopefully give you a sense of, of uh, caution uh, for, uh, for uh, your endeavors. Though I think on the whole, of course, it's enormously important. So, uh, uh, the, uh, I just uh, want to say a word about money markets in case somebody doesn't know what it is. It's really in the first line, wholesale market for low risk, high liquid, short term debt. The typical definition is under one year, uh, the money market, uh, do, uh, you know, maturities have come down. Uh, they are very, very, they, the size of, most sizable markets are overnight. Uh, they are uh, repos, uh, you know, uh, repos are almost the, all of them overnight. There are other things listed there, treasuries, agencies, I've seen this. It, the point is that this is a, this constant innovation in this market. There are, new, there are all debt instruments, but their debt, uh, debt in some ways is much more interesting than equity because it's much richer in what you can do with it. And as, uh, as already noted, there's just massive volume. I mean, we are talking about trillions and trillions per day uh, in over. So completely it was what's happening in the stock market. So the common view of crisis, I want to, I have a fairly simple message, which is that uh, there is a common view of crisis, which is, uh, as Asu mentioned already, that uh, there were crooks and, and complicated, opaque assets that were uh, 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 rated by uh, poorly and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps corrupt, uh, somewhat corrupt, the rating agencies. Uh, the big short is just uh, because it's a movie. I, I assume many have seen it. Uh, uh, you could summarize the, the movie as saying, you know, Michael Lewis, who is, a, by the way, a serious reporter, is asking basically the question, you know, why did, uh, uh, how could Wall Street trade without knowing any information, basically? And uh, that triggered or has triggered or, or, or I would say universal call for transparency. If there's anything we should do about this market, we should become more transparent. I mean, whatever else we do. And, uh, and that's the view I'm going to challenge. So the, I'm going to put forward an alternative view, which is uh, that that's, you know, not asking questions is the whole idea of money markets. That's exactly the way it's basically meant to operate. Money, which I assume all of you have in your pocket, you know, nobody asks, you know, why are you giving me a hundred dollar bill or something like that? Well, you may say it has a number on it, but the point is that there is nothing suspect about money. That's the normal state, and therefore, people will, uh, will money markets are characterized by this no questions asked feature. In that sense, ignorance is almost bliss. I put almost in the parentheses because, of course, somebody's got to know something. So I will come to that. But the traders, sort of the daily traders and so on, are definitely not in the business of trying to prove that what they are trading or peddling has a particular value or, and, and so forth. In fact, Badgett, you know, over 100 years ago, he already said this famous that Every banker knows that if he has to prove his word, worthy of credit, he has already lost it, basically. So uh, it, is a, it is a story about, uh, about uh, this information sparseness. So let me say what, what is, there's, a, there's a, a common but false inference in the, in the way uh, people look at it. And where, so where does this call for transparency come from? People think somehow that if you are not transparent, you are probably a crook or something. That's one view. Another view is that if you are transparent, then everybody will be on the same page. And it is that view that economists hold, and this is distinctly wrong. This is sort of the technical surprise, so to speak, that this may very frequently what happens is that when you become transparent, 
you don't get symmetric information, which is kind of the basis for, for liquid markets. You actually go perhaps from symmetric information, symmetric ignorance, to asymmetric information. And, uh, and, and uh, as an example, you know, if you are an expert and on, say, evaluating uh, a car that we both are bidding on or something like that, and we both just know the gross characteristics of the car, that you know it's a model, uh, it's a Volkswagen, to year 2000, to take my car. Uh, you know, uh, uh, then the expert doesn't have anything more to go with by than me, I have. But if the expert is given, say, the service manual, or can go and sit in the car, or drive it, or open the hood, or something like that, additional information, more information about the state, then suddenly I'm out. Because the expert can interpret it and I cannot. That's the basic, that's one of the basic me mechanisms in which sense, you know, giving more information may make for very asymmetric information in the market. So there are two ways of getting it. This is the key thing. Uh, there's the way to get, one way of getting it is to make sure everybody has every piece of relevant information and can process it. That's the, that's the world of the stock market. Typically, I come to that. But by over-collateralizing or making sure that something is sufficiently, have, there's enough value for what you are, what you are trading for, uh, you will actually be better off with uh, the second alternative. We are all ignorant, so we are symmetrically in the same place. So I uh, have the next slide. I think I will. Uh, what happened? Yeah. So uh, let me jump over that slide and, and, and just go. And I talked about the, the pawn shop is an example. I just talked through it. And, and it, it, it fits this picture in a way. A pawn shop is, a, is just a, we are, have a different view of the value of the price. Maybe I should just say it. Sorry about that. Uh, it, I bring in the watch. I think it's $500. I need $100. We don't have to agree on what the exact value of the watch is. And the pawn shop may not even value it as much as I do. I will still get my $100. So the idea is so much over collateralized that it is. The key, however, is I need to be able to buy it back. Otherwise, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell it for $100. But I will, if I get the right to buy it back at $100, then it works. It's an absolute brilliant idea. In fact, it's thousands and thousands of years old. And, uh, and so that robust logic is, this is one example where you are, you are sort of leaning on very little information, precise information. You just have enough information. And repo, actually, which I don't want to define here, is a really a version of the pawn shop. Repo is one of the biggest, maybe the biggest market uh, after foreign, foreign, foreign exchange. And, uh, and it's, it's actually an important market because that's where the trouble was. That's where the financial crisis essentially uh, got going. So it's called the run on repo. So uh, another, here's just a picture that I was, want to set up because I want to use it in, in a little while, is, is a picture of the debt contract. I think I have a key here. So you see the value of debt is this red line. It's the 45 degree line as a function of the underlying collateral value or liquidation value. You know, the debt is, is if it's in default, it has this 45 degree line. But if you pay back, it's, it has a just flat line. Notice that when you are paid back, when you are paying back your debt, we don't even know what the collateral value at the time is. You just pay it back, and then I know it's something up there. You know, it was enough. So this, very li this region here, especially, especially here for, uh, far out, is just very information insensitive to the changes in the collateral value. So the black line here is what the market value is. This is uh, the red line is at realization, but the black line is, you know, it's one month to go. This is priced like an option. And, uh, and uh, you see how it eventually hugs this. The shorter the maturity is, the closer it gets to the red line. So shorter maturity has more safe region than, than a longer maturity. And if the 
distribution of uh, collateral values out there, we are in business. We are in the information sensitive region. I don't have to know anything more. I don't have to know the, the exact value of your house, just that it's you know, three times more than you're asking money for. So uh, that's, the, that's, that's the whole logic of debt markets. Always the same. Just make it, you know, it can be trust, it can be the collateral value here can be trust or whatever, but you just have to believe it. So if you, if you look at money markets, uh, the first line tells you why it is so. Money markets are high velocity markets, trillion dollar repos trading in within an hour in the morning every day. You don't have the time to start exploring. You know, this is not a place where you start wondering, maybe is it, you know, is it worth? You either do it or you don't do it, and most of the time when you have to roll over repos overnight, you better do it, because if you don't do it, or a lot of people don't do it, panic can ensue. It's based on benchmark pricing. The ratings are very coarse for a reason, because the more coarse they are, the more we can be symmetrically informed. In fact, most are AAA, exactly because that's where everybody wants to be. And then we believe it's almost like money. And there's a shared understanding, it's trust-based. Then contrast that with stock markets. Uh, you, can, you don't have to trade. If I don't want to sell today, I don't sell. If I don't have to buy it today, I don't want to buy. Nothing bad happens to anybody. The volume keeps going up and down. You know, in stock markets, you look money markets, the volume is just flat. It's all, more or less flat. Every piece of information is relevant if you own a stock, because every $100 more means the price has to be paid $100 more, and so on. So uh, I should say I'm jumping off this, but I want to, uh, oh, the beers, which is a nice way of toiling, they, they, are, they are selling wholesale diamonds in bags that you can't look into. This is an example of, they absolutely make it impossible. This is the version of the expert story I started with. But uh, securitization, uh, TBA market, to be announced market. You buy a security, you pay a price for it, and then the government puts stuff in the bag that you are buying. You don't even know what you are buying at the time you are buying. It's the most liquid market in, in the repo in the sort of longer term repo area. Uh, I already said MFFs, money market funds, which have been just about to be re-regulated, they, they had delayed info release. They told only four times a year what the value, the collateral value was, and by the way, it's book value. They, four times a year they told what the value is that supported that money market account that you have a lot of us had and could draw checks on and so on. They promised the constant nav, meaning that you, if I put in a dollar, they will do everything they can to pay back a dollar. If they don't, if, and, and, and so very little information and a commitment to pay back a dollar. And when they released the information, by the way, it wasn't today's net asset value. It was the net asset value 60 days ago. Again, a deliberate effort to obscure what's in there. And then central banks, who presumably are not crooks, they have always been opaque. They don't tell who is going to discount window. They, don't want, they didn't want to say who took money for the stress test. Everything is opaque. So you have to somehow realize this, this isn't the big short story. You know, the guys who run to Florida and knocked on the doors, they were really the crazy guys. But unfortunately, sometimes it's good to have a few crazy guys around. But it's very rare. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but they, you know, they go to Florida to knock on the doors to see you know, exactly what these individual mortgages out of 10,000 in the bag, what they are worth. OK, so uh, there is a dark side. And that's when the crazy guys come into the picture. If you rely on this debt and securitization and course rating and mechanical rules, it does make sense in good times. That's my point. 99.99% of the time, this is how the system is supposed to operate and run. It did run, by the way, this way, 70 years in the United States. 
That's a pretty good record for a system to operate. But it pushes, the more you push you know, the, uh, on this sort of, on these instruments relying on securitization, course ratings, and so on, you are pushing risk into the tail. And it hides, importantly, the system, uh, systemic risk that people were talking about. So opacity enhances liquidity, but increases the risk and cost, especially the cost of a crisis. Uh, so in that picture I just talked about, we go, the crisis is defined by the fact that once in a lifetime, information sensitive debt in a significant amount goes, the collateral value drops. You know, the, re, the distribution isn't here anymore, it's actually down here. And something happens for you to wake up that it has moved. Notice that you get no information when people are paying back their loans, really, from the loan. But suddenly somebody doesn't. And so here you can see what happens. This was, this was a trigger for the whole financial crisis, or at least in one view. Triple A or double A home equity loan transits in August. It, it was a Bear Stearns fund that collapsed in July 2007. This is basically a residual fit model, but, uh, but what I'm, what's described here is the point to, here is these are individual trades, bilateral trades. So you see how from July 06, and, and we could go back further, to July of 2007, everybody basically priced the same. Because it was just a benchmark pricing. You go on your screen, you look, what did it sell for yesterday? I'm going to sell for the same. I'm just going with the crowd. And then suddenly this broke, you know, this had to be shut down, this fund. And then hell breaks loose. You know, nobody knows anything. Suddenly they wake up and say, well, we went with the benchmark and the benchmark disappeared. What is it going to be? And you are in the world sort of of stock markets that you have to figure out what is this thing worth. And everybody has their own idea about what it is worth. Some play it very safe, others don't play it self. Things get very Ill illiquid, prices very heterogeneous. Basically, this market breaks down. In addition, so this is a way, of, in addition, this has a contagion effect. I don't have the pictures, but if you go and look at what happened in the other markets, related markets, exactly the same. They say, oh my God, this market broke down, and I am having my money in similar funds. And then contagion just overnight, uh, you know, grow it. So, this domino theory, which Arsu uh, described, it is true that the domino exists, but I think it's pretty clear when you look at these things that there are at least periods of big contagion coming. Exactly because you go from not having to even think about it to suddenly having to think about it, and you know you have really no idea what is, what is happening. Where should you even start? This is a market that doesn't exist. And, and suddenly you have to come up with, with, with some informed decisions. So this, by the way, is very strong. I've just described to you or, or told you examples like deliberate opacity and then this collapse. This is support for this view. I would say this is overwhelming support for this view. Money markets are fundamentally information sparse and opaque in the sense that, you know, Nothing like the stock market. And, uh, and, uh, and so that, by the way, is a very important message, uh, that, uh, that they are two entirely different markets. And so one should not think about them even on the same day when one starts regulating things. So what is the good of this? Well, it has, despite this simply, just this realization that life is this way, has some policy implications. One of which was debated when the US had the crisis. And that is, should we open up the bags, so to speak, this ABS, this asset-backed security bags, which had thousands of pieces of mortgages, should we sort of open it up in all the banks and see, you know, what the hell are they worth? You know, the equivalent of these guys going to Florida and knocking on every door. And that was, that was how they got money from Congress. You know, they promised to buy up the toxic assets. Well, thank God they didn't. Because 
what would have happened if people wouldn't have believed they had bought up all the assets? How do you prove that you have bought up all the toxic assets? There are still assets around. You know, I'm now lost. So the key was to get back to no questions asked state. And the way you got back to the question asked state in this case, in the US case, was just recollateralize the whole thing. Just pour, I think it was $80 billion. So open the banks and say, if we put $80, $80 billion into the banks, just the biggest one, I think there were 18 banks. So they just went and showed the banks and said, if we pour this much money in, then uh, this system is safe. And thankfully, enough people believed that that was the case. And then the, the thing was uh, resolved. Again, budget was understood this over 100 years ago. Lend without limit. The two solvent firms is a, a complicated issue. Uh, but and good collateral, high rates is, is, is reasonable. But the key is lend without limit. When you have a crisis, there's only one place to go, and that is government. Just don't try anything else. Uh, and it is interesting to realize that in crisis, one of the responses you always see is opacity, further opacity. Roosevelt, you know, had a, had a week or was it a, a few days of, of holiday, bank holiday. Didn't tell any, no information coming out. Wanted to come. Clearing houses in the 19th century who used to publish the individual bank values stopped publishing the individual bank values. They took mutual responsibility for the liabilities. The bad banks in Scandinavia, of which fin I'm from Finland, so I, that was actually what got me interested in this whole thing. Basically, it was just government taking over and putting all the toxic assets. They took over and took the toxic assets. Uh, there are so few banks in Finland, you know, there are five banks, so it's easy. Uh, they took the toxic assets, put them in a big bank, re-collateralized and re-securitized. So that the, the very, very bad thing that people point to actually well, you, you just do it bigger and that's the way to get out of the crisis. <laughs> Draghi uh, uh, did the same subsequently and this is a very big lesson from this same, same view. The Europe got a crisis suddenly in 2000, was it nine or when it started, a little later than the US, it got contagion. And, uh, and they started telling you know how much money they have now put aside like 300 billion, 500 billion, 700 billion to actually say that the system is safe. Nothing happened to the spreads. The spreads just kept going up. Then comes Draghi one day and he says, well, I will do whatever it takes and you better believe it. Boom, they came down to essentially nothing. So here is a transparency saying, I have actually a billion, a trillion dollar, uh, euros you know, in place to defend the system. That didn't impress people. But when Draghi said it, just this very vague statement. One interpretation, one of course is that people knew, some of them at least knew that he had talked to the Merkel and gotten the chancellor on board. Uh, but the other thing to notice here is that it is of some importance that he didn't have to prove anything, or significant importance he hadn't improved, to prove anything specific. Whatever it takes, takes out the expert advantage. Because if you're an expert on financial market, I say, I do whatever I ta it takes. Well, guess what? You are on the same line with everybody else. You can't put whatever it takes into a spreadsheet and start calculating. You know, that's the problem. Billion dollars goes into a spreadsheet and a trillion dollars goes into a spreadsheet. Whatever it takes leaves everybody saying whatever it means. And thankfully, uh, people uh, thought it means good enough and, and, and the crisis was over. He has not, I don't think he himself knows what whatever it takes means. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I want to get to... Uh, a few policy implications from this simple uh, story. So one of these things is the stress test. I don't want to go into it. The, EU, uh, the, the US did it the right way. 
which is they took corrective action. The EU just opened the bags and said, well, you guys look, here, here's the whole data for all the banks. And I think it was actually what started the crisis in the U European Union. They, they became very transparent, so they violated this first rule of history, that you don't become more transparent when a crisis hits. Uh, higher capital requirements is really the, I don't want to, I could speak longer about it, but I think that's a simple system. I believe that that's, this rationalizes it. It is the step to recapitalize. That's basically what, the, what it says. What's interesting here is the third, oops, the third thing is notice that this perspective has the paradoxical conclusion that you become tra more transparent, less liquid, as I explained before. So it may be a good thing in good times to be more transparent because that reduces the liquidity. Quite the opposite what normal economic logic seems to say. And you have actually seen it right now because the money markets are now asked to show knobs every day. Guess what? Money left the money markets. You know, it's no longer money-like. It's not treated anymore like money. It's treated like an investment. And the... And they're somewhat nervous about it because it has trigger effects and so on. But, you know, people have fled the money much even before it even, it's, it's coming into effect uh, shortly. By the way, take out the money from the money market if you think it's money. Uh, the other thing, the other example is COCOS. These are, these are, uh, these are instruments that, uh, that uh, uh, you uh, so the contingent, contingent equity, or contingent debt in the sense that if, if, if the collateral goes down or the price of, the, of something goes down enough, then, then, you, then the people who buy, buy these cocos will be obligated to actually go from debt, have a, have a, a trans transition from uh, debt to equity. So the idea is that this is a sort of contingent equity. And, uh, and, uh, and the idea is that way you prop it up, you, you sort of build into the system already the recapitalization. Not a, a good idea for an individual bank. It turns out, and we saw this again, uh, it, it may trigger contagion because there is the people, some of, most of them looking, not noticing anything, and suddenly they see cocos kick in. And they say, well, what the hell is going on? and they wake up. So that can create contagion, and, and I think actually the, the cocos that you saw it in, in the last fall, I think, or was it in the spring, I forget now, that, uh, that cocos, uh, cocos uh, were sort of trouble. And that's also consistent with this same information view. Now, the last slide is, uh, is I have to say something about the IDSS, uh, you know, so, so uh, to, uh, you know, I, I I think this story is not about data per se, but I'm not saying either, and I want to emphasize it on the strongest, I'm not saying that it's somebody's got to know something. So I'm just talking about how you sort of interact with the market participants. But there is, of course, a big elephant in the room is, you know, systemic risk, which you, Daron and Azu have written about it and so on. I think it's important stuff. Who should handle that systemic risk and how should it be handled? My only message is transparency is not likely to be the way to handle unless you think that that way you will regulate actually the markets to be less liquid. So money markets will no longer be treated like banks. And as I said, I think this is a good thing. So that's, that's the way, uh, uh, that's one of the things that you can do. But in general understanding where the systemic risk is and so on, you know, uh, yes, data will help. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And, and if, if the data uh, is used wisely and I think you give sufficiently coarse information, I like to think of the, ele as I may say, elevator tests. I, I like the elevator test, which just says, this, this elevator, it, I think it's on, on every elevator, you know, at least in Finland, you know, it says it was inspected and found to be good. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, it is now good. They don't say we inspected it, you know, the machine was broken, the, the, the cables were so and so, you know, we patched them and we replaced them and so on. Uh, you, you don't, you know, 
the sort of species you hear nowadays in, in, in airplanes, you know. We can't take off now because the navigation system is not working. But wait just a few minutes. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's not the way. You should treat people with very coarse information. And like lawyers, don't say too much. Because, you know, you say more, suddenly it may stir more questions and nervousness ensues. So that's kind of the basic system. So I'm encouraging you to collect the data, but I'm even more strongly encouraging you to judiciously release it. And, and maybe release it just to the, to the regulators. But, and, and, and keep in mind that the safer you make the system, the less attentive and therefore the more riskier the investor behavior. So you have to somehow stop the investors from doing the risk. You have to be explicit about it. You can't just leave it. So this is a, one of the deep paradoxes. And the safe tri-party repo, which was, by the way, regulated and had a platform and everything, it was there where Lehman collapsed. The, the much berated over-the-counter market had all sorts of things happen to it, but it did not collapse. The collapse happened in the regulated, sort of highly regulated, centralized market. So these are some of the things, uh, things to think about in, in, uh, when, you are, when you do your wonderful data work and, and, uh, and uh, uh, use the data wisely or release the data wisely. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, time for questions. Uh, just like in the previous uh, sessions, we have two microphones. So uh, if I uh, could I ask the uh, people who are going to ask questions to perhaps use those microphones, that would be more efficient. Okay. Perhaps we can start. Thank you. Um, you alluded to it, but could you speak more about transparency and uh, risk of default or solvency? Because it seems that solvency is more probability of not being insolvent, but people make up numbers for probability of default and loss given default. When you say, could I, I could speak for another half an hour about it, but, I, but sure. what do you want to know? Well, um, it's Are you asking whether, I, I, it's really hard to answer the question in the sense okay. that, uh, or is there something specific you want well, to know that, that if, what if I want, think it should be done? Or? Yeah, and if you want uh, to understand solvency, you need some transparency. Or how, or how do you understand solvency with no transparency? Well, let me say this about, uh, you can ask, what is good transparency and what bad transparency? So let me try to answer that question. Which we don't have, uh, I struggle with it theoretically, but the sense is, we know from, if this thesis is right in money markets, in stock market, of course, transparency on the whole is good always. You know, they, they so make it clear. But that's because it's about risk sharing. That's because they are interested in every detail of the value. The, this market is not about the details of the value of the collateral, is my point. So uh, the key is to make sure, I think, that, that the, so the objective is to make sure people are on the same page, more or less except those that regulate and are responsible for you know, things not really going out of hand. And so, yes, for the Fed, they should be transparent. But for the market itself, I think you should look calm and say everything is fine, even when it isn't, by the way. Because uh, so, that, so how does that happen? It depends on, if I use this expert analogy, if you let out information that's complementary to the expert's information, then you are really creating more asymmetry in the market, typically. Mm -hmm. And this market is not a price discovery market, so that information isn't being used by others, other than if they, it's a panic. If the, if, the exp if the information you are putting out there substitutes for the expert's information, when the market already is asymmetric, then it, can go, then it can go the other way. We know it from auctions, for instance. That's a, that's a well-known theorem in auctions that you should really, the auctioneers should actually give out all the relevant information. So that's, that's one way uh, I, I, I would have. But uh, staying with transparency, staying with the Fed or the regulators and being transparent with them is, I think, mainly the way to go. So I'm not in favor of, for instance, stress tests 
you know, being released, you know, this was exactly what they found out. I think that's a, I'm really against it. Thanks for the and very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that the asset purchases and recapitalizing the banks was the right thing to do. Um, but there's a theory that this has contributed to increasing income inequality, which has sort of shifted the risk to the political system. So you have all these populist politicians and so on. So. Wow. I mean, I, if, if, if either you think about income inequality, when, when you have a crisis, you don't really think about income inequality. You think just to, let's save the system. So I don't know how to address the income inequality, but I don't think it comes from you know, saving the thing in crisis. What, what it needs to be understood, and is not understood very well, is you know, we shouldn't use taxpayer money. OK, so that's kind of a, that also is a fairly, I understand exactly why I think people think of it like that, but I think they exactly think incorrectly about it because they don't understand that they have, during this whole time when we got, you know, the money market was running smoothly and, you know, at a lower interest rate, they were the beneficiaries. Now, that's not to say condone, you know, this current crisis. So you shouldn't be doing obviously wrong things and so on. That's where the, you know, I, I'm, I should back off so much, but just, you know, to say taxpayers should not pay anything ever in a crisis just overlooks the fact that they have benefited greatly from this system. And if we make it, if we make it so safe, this system, that it never crashes, I think we have error on the other side because you have, money is going to be more expensive or credit is going to be more expensive. So I don't know if it gets to your inequality thing, but, uh, but obviously this system was meant to actually help the poor people. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, one of the examples that you gave for justifying the creation of symmetric information via ignorance was the European Central Bank's uh, statement that uh, we'll do whatever it takes and not solve the crisis. But I wonder if it solved the crisis or merely continued to hide the crisis and kick the can down the road. I mean, the financial crisis was in 2008, and not just in Europe, but generally around the world now, we're still in zero and even negative uh, interest rates. The economies are either growing really slowly or receding. And so I don't know if the crisis has actually been solved or just hidden by such policies. So I'd well, like it to... bought, The key was it bought, it bought them time. It's a different question, did they use the time wisely? Mm -hmm. And I think they haven't used their time wisely because they, had, they got out of the crisis and then they felt, well, things are smooth again. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Well, they continued to have to double down on the, the same methods over and over and over again. You know, three rounds of quantitative easing, uh, continually dropping the... A, you know, the U.S. has done the same. It's not... I, this takes us, I think, too far afield whether they have used their time in the right way. But I don't think when you, once you are in a crisis or on the brink of a crisis, really, uh, you don't think about those things. You just want some time. That was the idea of Roosevelt's, you know, bank holiday. Just give me some time to come up with a solution of some sort. Thank you. And, uh, and it was, uh, the solution was a great speech. You know, <laughs> it was a sort of a, it wasn't a whatever it takes speech, but it was a, you know, a fear, uh, what you need to fear. So you see how it is expectations are so big part of this crisis that it makes for hard how to give advice. So you made some very nice comments for those of us that, that haven't, haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this, about why we need to hide information and why opacity is useful. And on the other hand, there was this obvious conflict that you were, you were showing where when we do stress tests or elevator tests or other things, we need to somehow get at that information. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting in the context of this institute is there are new computational techniques that are available, for example, that would allow one to kind of obfuscate the data and, let's say, kind of 
metaphorically have it in a box that nobody can get at, and yet, and yet you would still allow, say, the, the person doing the policy to compute some function on that data and have, have everybody trust and even be able to verify mm -hmm. that the calculation was done correctly on the correct data, and the function could just release a yes, you passed the elevator test. So I, I, I'm just curious if, if we think about the way the computation might work with data and it expands the toolbox that's available to people doing policy, is this, there something that might be interesting there that, amongst the ideas I described? Have you heard of these approaches before? Well, I, it's clear, I mean, that's where people's call for transparency, I think, comes from the, the one talk to the big populations, is that they thought something was done incorrectly. It's interesting, by the way, nobody ever accepts that it was a mistake as an answer. And life is full of mistakes. But they always look for some culprit. So they are looking, they are, they, their sort of suspicion was that something crooked was happening there, and I think there was you know, something. But uh, so if that's what your primary worry is, that something shady is happening, then yes, transparency is the answer. But, yes. but I'm saying that here we have a whole big financial system. I didn't emphasize it enough. It is a low cost system. You understand that to have a transparent system run a stock market, despite its small volume, it's hugely more expensive to run than the trillion, trillion, trillion dollar market called the money market. It's cheap. It was possible to run it 3,000 years ago. You know, do you see the idea that, that that's, by the way, something I should say when you think about your data. When you optimize, you have to also think in economic terms, how expensive is it to get it to be better? But uh, coming back to your question, I think it's, it, obviously, if you have suspicions, then, then you have lost trust, and when you have lost trust, but my answer would be not to bring in the public, because this election will tell you why. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a serious remark, by the way. What's happening here is we have a layer that we used to have that was sort of taking care of the problem uh, you were talking about. That is, be that corporate governance, for instance, there used to be boards. I was on the board. We were supposed to be looking into it. They were sort of supposed to be checks and checks so that not everybody had to become informed is the idea. But now in this world, suddenly we have a situation where, A, everybody is trying to become informed, and, 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 and you, know, you see what happens uh, when, when you have a sort of, it worked in Athens, you know, 3,000 years ago or whatever, but it's not working very well right now. It's not working very well in corporate governance either. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same suspicion that they were crooks because we had a corporate crisis, which some of you are too young to remember, the Enron crisis that preceded the, the, the financial crisis. And it led to the same call for more transparency and involvement. So, we have, a, we have a crisis of leadership is what we have. Okay. Thank you. I guess... Uh, With that optimistic note, please, <laughs> please, please fix it. 